Hi, Gopi. Hello. <laughs> I'm Richard. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, just in the U.S. and uh, I got into filming things and putting them on YouTube. And so then, what's <laughs> really interesting this. to me is that uh, you know I'm of a certain age, right? And then, then uh, a lot of people that I know have faced long lives of like uphill and downhill, let's say. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I should call it struggle or what. <laughs> Some parts of struggle, I think. Yeah. And then some, you know, there is a natural uh, human movement of in and out, open and closed, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be very natural. And then sometimes we always make preferences and say, well, what about the open? I'll take the open part, but the closed part. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's closed too, uh, too I much. I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, you can't really have an open unless you were closed beforehand. And, you know, sometimes they need to be closed for a while to feel the need to open <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know it's, I don't know I can't think that everything is comes in twos you know light, dark good, bad whatever you know it's kind of you can't have one without the other so in one sense maybe you can't realize one without the other because yeah. you can have it maybe but you would just wouldn't even know it yeah absolutely I mean I got into a conversation about I mean I was actually watching Superman and I was getting really frustrated there was a bad guy and I was like, why can't Superman just exist and be good, you know? But they said Superman wouldn't exist without the bad guy, so... I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sometimes Superman is a dream, right? And so then we're just normal. We're not really super. Yeah. So then... In order to make a Superman really super, then we come up with these really super bad guys and make that our mythology. Definitely true. <laughs> Is that necessary though, you know? I don't know. We try to get a suit somebody that's over the top as far as being great and then we do that by contrasting with something that... Yeah, I mean... Like a mythology or something I'm saying, you know? Yeah, I just don't think that there's a... People tend to see the world in like types just like really specific block colors you know like that person has done one bad thing in their life so they are a bad person you know yeah. I mean depending on the you know yeah. size of the bad thing you know or you know that person is generally all good so they must be a really good person all the time but I think everyone has their own subtleties and their own vices and dreams that fall way out of the character which they're supposed to like cater to I mean that's kind of what I've seen through high school and you know, growing up all around the world and everything, it's kind of, you don't ever meet someone who's all good or all bad, you know, and you can't ever classify someone or judge somebody and put them into a type because you have no idea what they're going through and what is inside them. Because when I started to say that, it was because I was thinking that uh, we went through decades and decades kind of like of searching around and thinking we had something and then wondering if we did and then thinking we have to chase it back down again it slipped away or I mean so many things you know and so then I come to you because you're much younger than I am you know I don't want to make any category out of that or anything but maybe things are more obvious to you and your friends I don't know maybe it's not such a uh, far off uh, dream I mean I think from observing the world as it is right now that we're going through tremendous changes you know, that would have never been encountered before in you know the history of humanity because we've never once had the things available to us that are available to us now special to the youth and there is such a big change going on and there's such a big shift in consciousness that's going on that could happen for the positive but or not but for a while I'm does that optimistic. make confusion <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's confusion now all over the world. You know, there's still children starving. I hate to use that, you know, cliche, but there are. You know, and there's still people going to bed unhappy and waking up unhappy and everything. But I think that now we're on the cusp of something so huge that if we decide to seize it and really decide to embrace it and, you know, make the changes that are necessary in ourselves, then we could really push forward. Through, you through know. whatever, right? Yeah, through whatever it is. So, like, I mean, uh, that really caught me when you said embrace mm -hmm. it, you know, because 
I was going to ask you, like, well, what is, you know, we can visualize something that would be harmonious. But somehow it seems like when you were saying people go to bed happy, unhappy, they wake up unhappy, and they say, well, I can visualize something that would be happy, but how do I get there from here? I think it's because so much of our lifestyle nowadays is focused on being numb. You know, we spend hours in front of the TV that make us numb, spend hours on Facebook or, you know, whatever, also making us numb because we don't interact very much with each other. You know, every interaction now takes place over the internet or over texting. Or Does it count? I don't really think so because yeah. sometimes it does because people allow themselves to be much more raw over the internet. But I just think it's really sad that that's the only way that people can express themselves. You know, I think... What about then, if there was ever like uh, more uh, video chat rooms where you I can guess, actually but see, even yourself, so, you can't, see you each can't, other? You can't really... It's just kind of you're still sitting in front of a screen. And I think that really ruins it, the whole human interaction part. And I just think that people spend so much time on the internet and, you know, whatever, having a lifestyle that makes us basically really numb and really instant. You know, instant coffee, instant food, instant everything. Instant gratification, you know, that no one really takes the time out to know each other anymore. And I think even something as simple as that, just going out and going out with someone, anyone, you know, someone who you love or someone who you don't really know and just taking that chance to just go out and get off your computer and you know, really spend time with someone who empowers you and, you know, you empower them, I think it would make such a difference to people to just, to just have that just raw interaction, just like one coffee date a week, you know, with someone who makes would, you feel good. You know what I was thinking, like, as I was starting to go into some coffee houses before I came, I'm from U.S., you know, and I just came here, I haven't been here you know, even a week, and I was thinking, like, in one coffee, in the coffee houses, like, they should take one table in the middle and just have it, like, conversation table where you, yeah. you would just sit there expecting to talk to a stranger. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just, you know, it's, I think people find it really scary to take that chance to just come up to someone they don't know and say like, hey, and especially because there's so much fear nowadays that, you know, the person could be a rapist or a terrorist or something, you know, but a lot of the time people are just really lonely and they just need that kind of connection. And I think once people start to connect, there's absolutely no stopping them. Are we lonely without even knowing it? Absolutely. Sometimes I don't... We don't know the effect of it, right? So we don't even, we deny it. We're in denial so much. I... I wouldn't really call it denial, I would just call it unawareness. You know, I mean, to deny something, you have to be aware that it exists, but sometimes you don't really actually realize how lonely you are and how instant the life that you're living is. It's just, it's all based on just like quick seconds of instant gratification, and you don't take the time out to really develop things and really develop relationships and, you know, love and friendships and even a meal, you know? It's all just in the microwave. You buy it from the supermarket, in the freezer, you stick it straight in the microwave, and there you go. You know, and you don't want your life to be a microwave meal. That was yeah, a really weird was, metaphor. But, yeah, you know. No, that's a really good metaphor because I was just with the family and uh, they were kind of all, like they were just guys, right? The father and two sons. And they were kind of just grabbing food when they grabbed it. And each one would just eat things on their own. And once in a while they'd make a dish or something and leave it there, but they never really ate together. I said, let's make a dinner. Yeah, exactly. And even amongst families, like even something as simple as just having like a real family dinner, you know, yeah, so where you all sit down and, you know, you talk about stuff and... Talk about real things, you know, not just... How can you do that? Because, I mean, like, it seems... You have to make yourself. Yeah. Because we all, and with real things, we probably all think we know the answer, right? Or we pretend like we do. So then my answer is better than yours. We get into all that I'm right and you're wrong business. I think human relationships are really complex. And people have to take the time and the patience to solve them. And just because someone's a family member doesn't mean that you have to agree with them or have to make sense, but you have to accept that. And, you know, like, one of my friends is gay, and he is 18, and he, he is known for the past four years, and he didn't tell his parents, because he was so stressed out that they wouldn't agree with it, and they would, like, disown him and be really, really, really angry, because they'd been in a, like, relationship with each other, you know, mom and dad, typical, like, kind of suburban lifestyle for, like, 27 years or something, they've been together since forever, and then once he came out to them, they said, you know, we'll never really understand this choice, but we will support you through it, you know, and we'll never really... I've heard some really rough ones, you know, on parents, oh, absolutely. you know, because uh, being have. gay is not so rough, but having a sex change when you're 18 or something seems yeah, like no, really he didn't, weird, you know. No, he didn't want to have a sex change, but he was just, you know, wanted them to accept him for the fact yeah. that he was gay, and they did, which was really touching, because normally you hear these horror stories of parents throwing their kids out, and not understanding and just, you know, alienating them, alienating them and, you know, whatever. But this time his mom sat him down and said, you know, I wouldn't be able to understand what you're going through. But, you know, we'll always be here for you and we'll always accept you, you know, for who you are. 
And I think that's so necessary amongst parents and so necessary amongst everyone, actually. Is that in Australia? That's um, no, Australian Canada. parents? Canada. Um, yeah. Right. Would they do it in, Can- in Australia too, or is that a little too avant garde for? I don't know, actually. Australia, Australia's such a young country, you know, and it's gone through its fair share of, you know, awfulness with, you know, everything that happened with the indigenous people here and everything. But I feel that it's really still such a developing country because there's so many immigrants coming in that you can't really. There's no such thing as like a real Australian, you know. Like myself, I'm Israeli, Chilean born and grew up in India, lived here for six years, you know, seven years, sorry, and you know, everyone that you meet here, if you just dig like one generation back, they're not actually really Australian, so you have so much potential to work with as a country, but it's so developing, it still doesn't have any of its own like rules and traditions that have been ingrained into the consciousness of the people quite yet, that it does have the potential to be a really fast, I mean, forward-thinking country. And yeah, it's got a potential here. Yeah, and also right? I think that the youth... You know, I was, I mean, you know, I used the internet, of course, and I had a blog for a little while, which I write other people's blogs a lot and everything, and it was really interesting to see how much the youth are rising up and how aware they really are, you know, and now we're kind of categorized into this bunch of depressed teenagers who all they do is sit on Facebook and, you know, they're so numb and all they do is eat junk food and, you know, go and shoot up their schools and, you know, some stupid generalizations like that, but in truth, so many teenagers that I've met, I've so aware and are fighting so hard to show how aware they are about what's going on in the world and how much they want to change it. And the main thing that we, I think that we really lack is the strength to put our voices together as youth. Maybe there'll be this, you know, there's this thing coming up, Occupy, in the U.S. Have you heard, you heard of that? Have you? Occupy is some demonstrations that have been in a lot of cities and they kind of spread around the world into a lot of countries. Oh, with the, with the youth? The youth well, yeah, but they called it Occupy Wall Street. Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyhow, I, I want to ask you about that. But first I want to say, because like you said, you were here six years, so then you went to high school here, right? Yeah, I've been in high school here. My so is that a public school you went to or a private school? Um, no, I've been to two schools for no. high school. One was a very free-thinking Steiner school. And then another one was the polar opposite, a very strict Anglican grammar school. The uniform and rules up to your eyeballs. And I mean, I went back to the Steiner school afterwards because I only stayed. Oh, the Steiner, one. huh? Yeah. No, the, the first one was Steiner. Then I went to the. Oh, that had a lot of rules. No, no, the Steiner didn't at all. It oh, was yeah. very free thinking. Then I went to the other one, which was very strict and very restrictive. For Were you a able year. to handle that? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was always getting in trouble and, um, you know, for having my hair out or my nose ring in or, you know, getting into debates with the teachers about ideologies and, you know, whatever. And I didn't do very well academically there because it was too much pressure. And I felt as a ninth grade student, my academic effort should not define who I am. So I kind of got pissed off and left. And I went back to the standard school, which I'm now. And I will be entering my last two years of high school. And it's all based on art there. It's all based on, you know, your expression and forming proper relationship with your teachers instead of just, you know, this kind of prisoner warden type thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of school has to do with just keeping people off the street. You know, it's, a, it's kind of like a caretaker. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I also think that the education system will undergo some very big changes within the next decade or so because students all over the world are rising up and saying that this is not right. The way that Tell me the, how the kids get together and how they tolerate each other and how what kind of competition there is between them and, you know, how they if they really love each other. Or, you know, one thing I've always thought about is that schools should be uh, not stratified ages, should be mixed up so that uh, mentoring could be taught, you know, and it practiced. Yeah, absolutely. Personally, I think that the whole popularity type thing in high school is really bad the the way that society the societies are formed within high school the because society yeah. we idolize the people who normally in about 10 years will be going nowhere you know which sounds like a really harsh thing to say but you know if you're addicted to drugs and you know going out every weekend and putting absolutely zero effort into developing yourself as an actual mature human being who's able to accept responsibility what are you going to be doing at 20 and the kids who are always a little quirky and a little not so like outcast because I don't actually see this you know in a lot of sitcoms you know you see like the popular cheerleaders and the nerds and you know they're always battling it out it's, it's not like that you know there's much more integration and 
like I have friends from all different kinds of groups and you know there's always a few drifters who kind of drift between groups so there's never like a certain really like hierarchy but you can see the ones who are more idolized and the ones who are looked down upon and the ones who are looked down upon you can imagine them being really successful when they grow up are you a drifter definitely so you can move you can move yeah, in I, any water right yeah i've moved between a lot of different groups in my i've never i mean i've got a few specific friends who have had it since a very long time but even they don't belong to the same groups you know it's um that's what i also what i really liked about the standard school is that our grade even though we bicker and you know we really get into other's nerves sometimes and there's a like certain there's definitely two different groups there's still a lot of people who kind of integrate and come together and there's never any specific bullying and there's never any specific you know real hurtfulness that goes on but you see it in bigger schools and schools that are much more conventional you see a lot more of that whole kind of pecking order thing where you see the kids who are like classified as nerds don't really have many friends and it's really heartbreaking because you know what's the point <laughs> no but like uh, how about if you move from one group to another does does one, do any of the groups have the tendency to evict you and say well hey you're moving around with those other guys now oh, we don't, we oh, don't want no, you no, no. it's never it's never that strict it's never that black and white um, mm. bottom line is is that I'm not going to be hanging out with people who don't accept me for who I hang out with you know if someone has a problem with me hang out with another group and what's the point yeah. like you know, <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't really be seeking them out to be friends with them in the first place you know and also I've been with my boyfriend for a while, and um, he's a little older than me. He's two years older than me, and we've. Is he still in the school, or is he out already? No, he finished high school last year, and um, we, we've been together for almost a year and a half now. And he is the absolute, complete different to me. You know, he comes from a very conventional house. He's had very conventional schooling, and he's quite an open-minded person, which is really refreshing to be around. Because he's, you know, he doesn't like the fact that, you know, he wasn't you know, grown up in a hippie town with hippie parents doing all sorts of hippie things his entire life restrict him from exploring new things. He's um, taught me a lot about, I don't know, becoming stronger in who I am. Because Is he a practical person? Like having practical, a lot of, I would take, say, Australians are very practical. He's very practical and he's very efficient and I'm a mess. So it's kind of funny because we clash a lot about that. But um, we get along really, really well in general. So that's really good to have that kind of relationship that I can fall back on. And I'm not saying that necessarily it has to be a boyfriend with people. Just just having someone in your life who's really different to you. So you really learn to be strong in who you are to keep that alive. You know, you don't want to become a chameleon. Because normally when people like you, they like you for who you are. And once you start to try and blend into who you know they might be and to try and fit in desperately, they'll probably get sick of it. Sometimes we don't really search to be a chameleon, but in a way we do it in reverse. In other words, we search people that are exactly like us, mm. that are chameleons, so that, you know, we're only going with people that agree with us because we figure there'd be less friction mm. or I don't know what. Even so, you will never, ever respect someone like that and you won't stay with them. That's just what I've noticed. Like, if, if, if someone comes onto me and hangs onto me and starts to agree with everything I do and everything I say, and I just get kind of sick of it. I'm like, come on, you know, who, be your own person. Like, what are you trying to pull? Like... It's, it's, I don't know, it's, because I know a lot of the time they might disagree with what I say, but they just continue agreeing simply because they are afraid that I'm going to, like, shun them or that someone else will shun them. I just, I see it so much in high school and it's just like, you don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to do that to yourself. Like, come, just rise up, you know. I don't know. I'm, so then I'm really if there's tired. some nerds or somebody that don't have any friends, I mean, would you ever have a feeling to just go out and reach out to them and say, look, honestly, I mean, I've never I know met you're... anyone who specifically has zero friends. Yeah. There will always be people who love them, you know, parents, relatives, whoever. And um, I do, the kids who are, you know, classified as nerds, normally they hang out with other people who have similar interests to theirs, you know, whether it be, I don't know what's classified as nerdy, like comic books and video games or whatever. And a lot of the time I've noticed with cliques in high school when, you know, the guy, like let's say like a super, like a good popular jock guy, they're supposed to fall for the girls who are blonde and cheerleaders and all sporty. Normally they fall for the weird dark chicks who are into like strange music and, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah their own kind of thing and whatever. And it's, it's kind of that kind of diversity that I think will really... What do you think of video games? Is that kind of like play. a craze? I play Tetris when I'm supposed to be doing homework. But that's basically my limit. Yeah. I don't. I don't play many video games. Um, well, what about the guys? Who get, do the girls do it too, or is it only I a guy? Few, I know a few girls who do a lot of gaming. Yeah. And, um, 
I think as long as it doesn't start to con- like consume your life, it's actually quite an interesting thing. You know, it really improves like your dexterity and everything. From what I've learned, you know, uh, I don't really like to play them because I get headaches if I spend too long in front of a screen, and then I just kind of walk off and I'm just like, oh my god, you know, get really dizzy. But I always think like, well, somebody made it up, you know, and I don't want to get into their head. I want to just be in my head. Right? Yeah, that's actually a really good way to look at it. Personally, it's just for me. It's another thing about one of those things in your life that makes you numb. You know, because now basically you've got the whole outside in your computer skin screen. You know, you'll have trees and flowers and lake and whatever, all that you can like play with. And you forget what it's like to actually go outside and be by an actual lake, you know, and actually smell the water and actually be around the trees and actually feel the wind and everything. And I think it's really necessary. I mean, I read this thing and it was um, like, it was um, like advice for life. And it said, spend at least an hour a day in nature because it's like, uh, pressing a reset button on your mind and wiping away all the crazy <laughs> and I thought that was pretty relevant especially nowadays you probably had a lot of looks at your own mind and you know a lot of coaching about you know how much you can trust your your thoughts and so on and uh, maybe you've looked at it from a lot of different angles and maybe you're not so, such a tight fit in your skull if, I don't know if that's a good way to explain it like where you just can't turn around and even look at your own thoughts but oh I mean, yeah I mean I'm constantly analyzing what's going on in my head you know because I just really I find it really interesting you know how, how and everything that goes goes along also ricochets in your body too right because it makes a feeling if you think certain thoughts that you feel oh yeah whoa and then if you think other ones you feel way better right mm-hmm. Sure. But anyhow, then you think, well, I can't just make up those thoughts. Something about them is real, and it comes from outside. And I don't it's because know. my eyes and your ears and my situations. A lot are of the such. time, I find my thoughts are just. I mean, of course, a few of them are, are valid and come from things that happen in my life. But you know, it's really easy to kind of screw with your own head and make yourself think about things that aren't actually existing, and then you cause yourself a lot of unnecessary trouble and yeah. pain that you don't need to go through. You know, like. Assuming what sometimes thoughts are really or... like uh, this is what I see in my life anyhow that sometimes thoughts are obvious and they have you know verbal meanings but other times they're kind of like subtle and they just kind of like have a, a closed windows of opportunity you know it's kind of like a belief that nothing's happening here that I'm not going to get anywhere that all these people don't like me that uh, the teachers are against me there's no justice in the school are all these kind of things that are not really always verbalized but it, it's still a feeling right oh yeah and there's still I mean I went through that big time last year when I was at the um, other school yeah I was actually quite unhappy and I didn't even realize it you know yeah. and, it's and you just, don't realize it just like you said right yeah and then you kind of take a quick look at yourself and you really have to think about things and then you just realize like wow I'm actually miserable here but you <laughs> know you're totally change. depressed right and you just think yeah. oh my god that's I mean like you're kind of a captive by that right <laughs> You know, I'm not even so much. I think it's quite easy to stop being sad. Pardon me? I think it's quite easy to stop being sad, but it's a really, really conscious choice, and you have to do it because it's not enough to just say, I want to be happy and then do nothing. You know, you have to. What's the story? Because, like, in a way, we're kind of like, we're believing that if we just do that on our own, it's fake. And we're kidding ourselves, but we want to see the evidence outside. But you can't depend on other people to make you happy either. You can't just. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm not saying you can or you can't, but I'm just saying the normal. The normal is to depend on the outsides and keep (laughs) keep tweaking the outsides, right? If I was on the beach, if I was here, if I was there, then if these people weren't like this, no. If if I had a better job, if you've got demons inside your head, they're going to stay there no matter how much you change your scenery. You got to get rid of your demons first, and then you just kind of. Oh wow, that's really advice. Huh? That's really interesting advice. You know, <laughs> it's what I experienced, you know. I mean, yeah. I had my own demons going on for a while, and and you took them with you really, wherever you went, huh? Yeah, I would go. I could go to the freaking, you know, top of the, the most beautiful place in the whole entire world, and still, still a depression or some yeah, kind of still uh, just feel resignment awful. or something was there. Huh? Yeah, you can't you can't just you know change something in the outside and expect everything on the inside to fall into place. You know, you've got to beautiful mess inside yourself and you have to kind of dive in and fix it you know yeah. and you can't be afraid of that yeah, and yeah. a lot of people are because they they don't know what they're going to find and they're really scared that they might find something vulnerable or something uh, wrong and I don't think there's anything wrong with that either you know? so in other words I was kind of figuring that you know that you had, l- had looked at yourself in a pretty good way and then I, would, they, well, I wanted to kind of translate that to school and say well what do, what do you observe in the others 
you know, are they all tied up in their I head? I think or... they, a lot of them have their own demons, yeah. which aren't verbalized enough and aren't worked through enough amongst themselves, amongst their parents, amongst, you know, their own... For some reason, it doesn't seem allowed to, to verbalize and to work through it, right? Yeah, it I mean, there's, like a lot of, there's a lot of, like, you know, um, if encouragement. If you have demons, it's got kind of embarrassment. From the media. Huh? Yeah, there's a lot of encouragement from the media to, like, tell people when you're, like, for example, with bullying. Like, tell people when you're being bullied. You know, go to your favorite teacher, go to your parents. But a lot of the time, nothing's going to be done about it, you know? And that's what I've seen in real life, you know? In magazines and in TV, it's always, like, speak to someone if you're being bullied, blah, 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 blah. But talking to someone else as therapeutic as it might be normally won't fix the problem because the bully themselves have got their own demons and until the bully fixes you know what's going on inside themselves they're not going to change even if you put them on detention for a month they will continue bullying sometimes even not even aware that they're doing it simply because a lot of times they've got so much going on inside themselves that they don't have the heightened really awareness to kind of try and fix it and then they continue kind of wrecking havoc or, you know, hurting others. Is there any way to support people like your friends like through emotional problems or through uh, being bound up? Or you said there's not really a structure where people can open up and where they can share. And I think that people get embarrassed way too easily nowadays. So to come up to someone and just say, tell me what's going on, talk to me, they, get, they might get creeped out or they might get you know kind of like offended like oh well why you know why me oh, yeah why me why are you asking me to tell you about stuff you know I, I can deal with it by myself and then they get too embarrassed to like even speak about their own things that are going on you know and i just think as what i was saying before like human humanity needs to be more connected and just to have that like just you know once a week coffee date of like real connection with someone else someone who makes you feel good and someone who brings a smile to your face and like you know you support each other it just it means so much and that's, you know, speaking of someone who's drifted a lot, as I said, you know, amongst friends and amongst social groups. And, um, you know, a lot of the time I find, like, sometimes I won't talk to my best friend for a while. And then suddenly me and him will sit down and we'll have a real conversation about something and we'll, like, you know, I'll unload whatever's going on with me, you know, and then he'll tell me about what's going on in his life. And suddenly afterwards you just feel so much lighter and you just feel like, wow, you know, it's just to connect with someone, you know. It's just, it means so much. And... That's what I was saying before with my boyfriend. Like, I really have that with him. And I'm just saying it's really good to have that with somebody, whether it be a relative or a friend or a teacher or whoever, you know, as long as it's not inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. Then you really access a way to kind of free yourself from that. How could you insert that into school some way? Because, like, you, you you pinned the problem, but, I mean, even if you wrote a paper and said people are embarrassed too easily. Like, actually, that could be the, present, uh, the premise of it, you know? People are embarrassed really too easily. A really good school counselor. Oh, yeah? A really good school counselor actually really helps. Like, last year, I'm not a very religious person. Actually, a lot of the time, like, when, you know, talk of religion or whatever comes up, it really pains me because religion really frustrates me. And last year at my old school, I actually, the school counselor was a priest. And when I was going through a bit of a hard time, I spoke to him about it. And he was really, really great. And it was really a good lesson for me to learn that, you know, like, just because someone's religious doesn't mean that, you know, they're going to be as um, close-minded as I think they are. Yeah. You know? And I found myself being able to open up to him about a lot of stuff. And it was really, really great, really healthy. And a lot of the, I mean, I've met a few school counselors who are very patronizing. You know, just people who I've met, just who happen, like their profession happens to be a school counselor. They're very patronizing and they can be... You know, have all these ideas on how to fix teenagers, but they also cater to that belief that teenagers are just these bunch of, you know, depressed kids who are really disrespectful, who all they do is sit on the computer and blah, 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 as I said before, and they don't really help very much. But once you meet a really good school counselor who actually can put them, can empathize, and um, does actually have a very kind heart, then it helps out a lot in schools. You know, it's really difficult to be honest between the generations. You know, it's, um, maybe it's impossible, you know, because like, what, is, what do I mean by honest? Because like honest might mean that I don't have any expectations of you and you don't have any expectations of me. And then if we don't really want to get something out of each other, we don't have any barriers either. Right. And then we can really have a total opening and uh, we can have a, a, a hard to hard talk. But when you're older, like I've tried to purify myself some way, but. 
expectations creep in because we say, oh my God, that person's in such a beautiful place. If they just put a couple of years like, this. you know, advice creeps in, you know, mm. these ideas, you know, and nobody wants it. You I don't know? think there's anything wrong with, maybe not advice, but um, like the sharing of your perspectives. Oh, as yeah. long as it's unimposed, you know, that's, that's kind of what frustrates me about religion is that like, I mean, a lot of ideologies, like the foundation of religion, I find it really beautiful. You know, like in Christianity, you know, don't hate each other, don't kill. Basically, just, you know, common things that will lead you to be a good human. And, you know, in Buddhism and Hinduism and everything, it's, um, in Islam, it's, they have really beautiful ideologies. But what I find really frustrating is that normally religious people are always trying to kind of, like, make you believe in their religion. Yeah, exactly. And, See what I was saying? Like, they have an expectation that they could just give you the right key. Yeah, exactly. That you and would that, just fall in line, you know? You would be in the fold and you would be saved or some damn thing. Yeah, you know? I mean, it I recently even... went to my first church service like two weeks ago and I came out like just freaking out about how much they were just. Because I went, I had to go for like a school trip thing. And it, for me, it was just like, what? Like, so much of what they were saying was so beautiful. Like, it doesn't matter what color we are, we all come together. We, you know, we all. Blah, 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 until they said we all have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I said, no, you know, just because, you know, we all may be great people, but it doesn't mean that we all have to believe in the same God. And I well, think even to believe in saving, you know, because you've got to be lost to be found, right? Yeah. So then you got to believe in lo- and being lost, I suppose. But I mean, that kind of gets me too. But you should be able to save your own self, you know, control your own life. You are your own God. You are your own, you know, source of power. And you don't have to... I, that's what I don't like about the whole putting stock and faith into that something else will fix it for you and something else will change it for you. And that's, I just don't, you know, if it works for some people, then that's great, you know, yeah. but a lot of the time I find, I find people using it as an excuse, like as a crutch and as an excuse to, you know, f- feel like they've um, drawn the short straw, you know, and yeah. last misfortunes because oh, they yeah. believe that... <clears throat> You know, God didn't provide and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, you have to work for what you want. Yeah, no, in one way, it's like uh, it's an excuse for no action, you know, no activity, for disengaging and just saying, hocus pocus, I'll just keep praying. Yeah, exactly, that's what I mean. And it might work, too. Praying probably works, too. But, I mean, uh, let's put our own hands in there and take some steps, right? You know, so it's kind of, you know, God may provide, but in weird ways. So God provides for you who's got hands and feet, right? And is doing so. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I don't, you know, as beautiful as religion's ideologies are, it's normally the people who are very religious that tend to really frustrate me because they live in a box this big. <laughs> well, I mean, the worst part is if they have expectations and want you to see the light. Mm. And if they're just okay with you being where you are, then they're, real, they're totally okay in their box if they want to be there. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, I've got a few friends who are religious, and they're great. You know, from my, actually, from my old school, I made really good friends there. And, you know, one of my like, closest girlfriends over there, she's Catholic. But she has never once had to say, you know, G- you should accept Jesus too. Why are you such a hippie? You know, why do you live, you know, why do you do this and why do you do that? And blah, blah, blah. She's just been like, that's my religion. You don't have one. That's cool. You know, it's just been that simple. And um, I really appreciate her for it. You know, it's been it's that's a really like refreshing thing to have when someone who doesn't believe in the same things you do, but they accept you for it. And Does I think it? that's also a very big component with what's happening in the world nowadays. People have to start accepting each other <laughs> because the more you're trying to change someone, the more you're judging someone, you're pushing them away. You're basically just you know creating even more disconnection and more mess. <laughs> Does Australia have, like, freedom of speech laws? Or, I mean, in other words, like, oh, yeah. the, uh, Occupy Wall Street is kind of based on a uh, part of the, our Constitution that says we can somehow gather and we can somehow speak our peace, right? And if we can't gather in, the, in the governmental buildings, we can just gather out on the street or wherever, you know. Somehow we're supposed to have a right to uh, assemble. And uh, so then that's what that Occupy Wall Street is about. And then it's gone into a lot of cities. You know, I was in Chicago, so they had to Occupy Chicago. And they're just people getting together and and talking, like you said, you know, on some open forum or just being able to have a hard, hard talk about what's really, what is it that's wrong here? Not even if you don't know, but just kind of put it on the table and say, like, let's look at it, look at it, look at it. And... uh, I don't know. I think it has to be led by the youth, really. 
because there's so much complacency in in the older generations. Yeah, and that's you know I wish it was something that the youth could realize that they do have a voice. I don't know. It's a hard thing though because the world's very big and you're very small, and normally, as there is a lot of complacency, but there's a lot of judgment towards youth. As I said before, and to kind of battle that and overcome those judgments it's really hard you know the average youth has their own slew of insecurity to deal with they don't want to have to try and change the world too you know and then once yeah it's just it's a very hard thing to deal with well in so many countries you know they got these national debts that get bigger and bigger and bigger see and in a way it seems like the youth are going to have to face that and fix this broken society yeah which is really frustrating I mean I kind of really resent adults worldwide for screwing things up for us you know no kidding we're We're giving you really a pile of junk yeah as far as society I mean I'm pretty optimistic about you know people rising up youth specifically rising up and kind of seizing the planet and being like okay you know what like enough now this is our future stop screwing up well you know what if you would do it I would come with but I'm not, I don't feel would. like I'd do it. I do it. Mean. The adults would just jump right in there and just say, God, it's about time. Thank you, because I couldn't do it. Yeah. And I apologize for that. I think it's kind of time for both of them to kind of, yeah. you know, start to do things together. You know, because a lot of youth judge adults, and a lot of adults judge youth, and then you're basically kind of left with these two unsure, like, sides that don't know who to send over first and, you know, whatever. And it's just, I've met a lot of really, really open-minded, really supportive adults in my lifetime. I mean, maybe it's living in this area and being brought up the way I was, but I have, you know, a lot of hope for youth relations with adults, and I have a lot of, you know, optimism, but it, it's not going to come without hard work. You know, I don't know, do you feel like you're, do you, can you feel the pressure of judgment? Because like, I mean, you said, uh, you used judge to judge as long adults, as water you know, in the ocean. I don't feel like any, any judgment on me, I don't know, I don't know what, maybe I'm too typical and I'm not blend into the scenery too much but I no, don't know people, why. people don't judge each other forever you know it's been around since millennium you know since the beginning of time you know like oh my cave's bigger than yours you know like I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just like it's always gonna happen you know always always you know friends judge friends you know sometimes I judge my boyfriend on what he's wearing that day you know like it's everyone judges each other as long as it's not something that runs you know under everything you do and everything you say to somebody, this kind of judgment that you're better than them, then I think it's fine. And there is a lot of judgment, and I feel a lot of judgment coming towards me, you know, for, God, whoever, you know, it depends on who's judging me for what, you know, but I've been judged on my relationship, my friends, my parents, what I wear, you know, what I do, what I say. And, well, those people are just insignificant, you know, and they're just, they're just, they judge themselves so harshly that they feel like they have the right to judge everyone else too. Normally, you find the people who are the most judgmental are the ones with the biggest self esteem gaps. And you just have to learn to overcome that. You know, would it be that uh, there's any truth to, like, uh, the, the, the sting of judgment, the things that sting the worst are things you semi believe in, and the things that don't, uh, you know, you don't totally, you totally know that you're not, those judgments would not, would not penetrate at all because you would be totally confident that you know so somehow if you looked at your own doubts about yourself no i'm just not saying you you know gopi i'm just saying everybody uh somehow you, you could even be able to digest judgment hmm. absolutely and you know sometimes you get cold names it just absolutely have nothing to do with who you are and you just know that the person's just being petty and lame and just you know using an insult that's been used a thousand times before and you notice that a lot on the internet because it's a lot of like anonymous verbal abuse I mean not verbal like just typed abuse you know and um you sometimes get something just like you know someone calling you a bitch or whatever and you're just like I know that I'm not so you are cowardly and lame like just you know yeah. move along now but then normally judgment from people who love you and people who you love is quite difficult to accept but sometimes it's something that can be a bit of a tip off as to how they perceive you, and, you know, I'm sure we all at each other all the time in positive and negative ways, you know, and I don't think it's something that's going to end, or something that you can let go of, but it's something that can definitely be softened, and something that can definitely be, um, 
stop ha- stop like having that much importance you know what people think of you and the judgments and whatever just you know don't don't put it as your number one priority that's never going to get you anywhere in life you know you're just going to be counting all the people who's giving you a boost or you know squishing you down or whatever and it's just you know have your own have your own self-esteem going so you don't have need to depend on other people's judgments as validation for what you may and may not be or think beautiful do you have I, uh, any? Um, are you active with the Aboriginal uh, problems or the, the Native Australian peoples? Um, active is. I don't know what you know. Oh, I don't got, know. I've got a fair few Aboriginal friends who I hang out with, and you know, Mom is super close with Carrie Ann, so uh-huh. you know, I'm opening for her tonight. So I don't really have any judgment about that whatsoever. And actually, I just spent two weeks in Vanuatu with school camp, which uh-huh. is just an island, um, French Polynesia. And it was a life-changing experience, absolutely. The most beautiful people I've ever met in my entire life. The happiest, kindest, most welcoming people I've ever encountered. So sweet. And it was amazing being there because they had they did not run on the same kind of laws and, um, you know, social stuff that we do. And, like, for example, we're trying to teach the village boys the meaning of the word awkward. And they did not understand it. Like, we were trying to explain, we're like, okay, well, let's say your pants fall over, like, you know, you know, kind of fall down in public or whatever. And they were just like, so I just pick them back up. You know, like, they just don't, they don't have that. And it's, I think it's a lot, with a lot of Indigenous people that I've met in my lifetime, they don't have that kind of social, like, sorry for want of a better word, crap that we all adhere to. And it's really, it's really refreshing. And um, I've spoken to um, a few Aboriginal people, you know, youth my, like my age, about um, what it's like to live nowadays. And how can we share that? How can we share that, share what you saw when you were at that camp? Um, my journal, I guess. <laughs> I oh yeah, I don't no, know. but I mean, you know, in in some way, get out, get what, get it out. What's happening? Um. You know, and how other ways to live, and then uh, you know things that we well, I mean, do that so ignore people. Well, there's so many ways of sharing information nowadays. It's just yeah. you know, a click of a button, you know. Right. So you know, start a blog about it, start a website, whatever. And um, I think it's also just a really internal thing. Like once you start to see the world differently, you'll start to treat everything differently around mm-hmm. you, which will have its own implications, whether negative or positive. And I think that people create a lot more change that they are aware of. You know, just even one simple comment to someone might really change them. You know, like, I've had people tell me that something that I said to them when I was, like, five years old changed their lives. Like, this family friend of my mom's, um, she had had surgery on her teeth, and I was seven years old, and I came into a room, and she was really upset about it because she said it really hurt, and I said, don't worry, this will pass. And she, like, took that completely to heart, and... Um, came up to me when I was like 12 and said thank you so much for saying this and blah blah blah, oh, blah. Wow. and it was what? <laughs> you know, like, should not have had that much impact but you can't underestimate how much you as an individual impact people around you you know people a lot a lot of youth tend to feel like worthless and unloved and unseen and whatever but a lot of the time I find that to be really incorrect in- incorrect so then it's kind of like if we paid attention to every small word, you know, even making small and subtle things, maybe the subtle things, because that was so subtle, what you said there. Yeah, seven. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, the butterfly effect, I guess. Oh, yeah. Comes into play there. Thanks so much for taking a little time. And, no and problem. I, yeah, thanks for the interesting conversation. <laughs> I really I was totally interested. In, <laughs> I'd love to meet your friends and your boyfriend and everybody, really. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, anyway. Thank you, Bill. Okay, bye. Bye.